Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, you may see from my background that it's early morning here in Asheville, North Carolina, um, but uh, always good to, to uh, be asked to come back to Kursig even if it's, uh, it's just virtual this time. So let me share my screen and jump into the presentation. So what I'm gonna talk about today just briefly are some, some of the ideas that Sal Augusta and I have, have developed following, this is an expansion of the final chapter of our book last year, a book in 2020 called uh, The Major Metaphors of Evolution. And uh, so we have a book that's, that we have just finished that uh, is not in production yet, but um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ideas that have come from that. And mostly what we've just, we have concluded is that, and we're not original with this conclusion, of course, is, is that the, the solution to the, the, the challenges that humanity faces at this point in time are not technological, will not be solved by technology. They'll be solved by changes in human behavior. Um, as I said, we're, not, we're certainly not the first people to say that. But we think that there are some insights from a basic evolutionary biology that can help facilitate those sorts of changes. Now, we know that changing behavior is very difficult for three reasons. The first is that humans have a strong need for drama. Crisis response is more emotionally satisfying than effective pre, uh, prevention. Every good politician knows this. This is why no politician ever invests in being proactive or in anticipating the future, but only invest in looking like a hero after a crisis is over. We have a strong attraction to magic. And in, the, in contemporary society that is, is manifested in a belief that technology that we don't understand is going to save us somehow. And we also have a very strong aversion to bad news, especially news that involves taking personal responsibility. So these are sort of built-in features that we need to understand and, and overcome if we're to, in fact, change our behavior effectively. Now, Darwinian evolution is basically a phenomenon or a, a theory of conflict resolution by this process called ecological fitting and sloppy fitness space, followed by co-accommodation, all reinforced by natural selection. And none of that means anything to anybody except a few specialists. But what it boils down to is this, when environmental conditions are stable, biological systems exploit their surroundings, they specialize ecologically, and they accumulate potential. When the conditions change, they, they biological systems alter their behavior from exploitation to exploration of the surroundings, they generalize their behavior as much as possible, and they do that by spending some of the potential that was accumulated during the good times. And we'll see how this, this plays out in terms of, of human behavior. So a good example of, of, of accessing stored potential in evolution is this diagram that most of you have seen. This is, is almost always presented as a picture of mass extinctions environmental catastrophes, and if, and if we're not careful, we're going to do the same thing today. So these are where you see at the bottom here where it says extinction, 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 extinction. These are the five major uh, mass extinctions, and you probably all heard uh, lots of stories about how we are now creating the sixth great mass extinction. From an evolutionary standpoint, the extinction point is not what's most important. What is most important is what happens after every single mass extinction. Evolution is the only process that has allowed the biosphere to survive and to re-diversify following a major environmental catastrophe. And it has never failed in 4 billion years. So this alone tells us that perhaps we should think a little bit about evolutionary principles in trying to cope with our own near-term survival. We can survive, 
But as I said before, we need to alter our behavior. And to do that, we need guidelines because one of the things that, that we're very convinced of, along with a, a sort of a new wave of, of anthropologists and paleoanthropologists, is that human beings changed their evolutionary trajectory about 9,000 years ago. Before the Anthropocene, human evolution was fundamentally Darwinian in the following sense. If the conditions were stable, people stayed where they were and survived. If the conditions changed, they tried to cope with the changing conditions using what technology, what capacities they already had. If they weren't able to cope, they simply ran away from the place where the conditions were, were unlivable. If they were unable to do that, they died. And this is kind of Darwinian evolution in a nutshell. But in the Holocene, in the Anthropocene, sorry, beginning at the, at the beginning of the Holocene, uh, human evolution took a decided turn. Uh, at some point, some human beings decided that even if the environmental conditions made their local circumstances unlivable, they were not going to leave those places. Instead, they were going to go to their neighbors and they were going to take from their neighbors what they needed to be able to survive in place. And this led to a number of, of important ideas that are still with us today that are evolutionarily, uh, these are, are, are fallacious assumptions about survival. One is the idea that growth is good. One of Darwin's primary insights was that growth is, in fact, pathological in all living systems, but inescapable. The notion that everything in life is about survival of the fittest, that, wasn't, that term wasn't coined uh, uh, until about 20 years after, uh, sorry, about, about three years after Darwin published his, his book, uh, and it didn't become well entrenched in evolutionary biology until about 20 years after Darwin published his book. And the idea that technology will save us. So growth is good. It's all about survival of the fittest. Technology will save us. These are three fundamental fallacies about life that are deeply embedded in, in our behavior today from, from the individual level to institutional levels. What we created beginning about 9,000 years ago was 9,000 years of evolutionary arms races. And beginning in the 1870s, due to the influence of a sociologist named Herbert Spencer, who was the person who coined the term survival of the fittest, even evolutionary biology adopted the idea that evolutionary arms races were in fact the way evolution worked. However, that however you might feel about that particular assertion, we need to understand that evolutionary arms races are not Darwinian because they are episodes of constant conflict, mostly winners and losers, conflict and replacement, new conflict, new replacement. They are episodes of constant conflict without the possibility of conflict resolution. Darwinism, as Darwin proposed it, was in fact a theory of conflict resolution. The important thing about Darwin was the resolution of conflict, not the conflict itself. But by the 20th century, and for most of the 20th century, evolutionary biologists convinced themselves that conflict was a natural part of evolution. And so they were arguing from human behavior back into the natural world. And they made a fundamental mistake in that assertion. And because arms races never lead to conflict resolution, the Anthropocene was never going to be sustainable. And given the current circumstances, it's actually astonishing that we've survived to this point. But that means, of course, that we have options. We still have options. There's still the possibility of, of changing our behavior so that we can survive. We need to change the conversation because to most people, sustain, sustainability suggests that what human doing, humans are doing is fundamentally correct. And if we just do a little less of it or we do it a little more efficiently, then 
all the problems in the, in the environment will stop changing and we will not have to alter our behavior. Any efforts to pursue sustainability in this sense are failing because climate change continues no matter what we're, we think we're doing right now and new challenges keep un, overrunning our efforts to try to cope. So what we think we need to do is to change the conversation from sustainability in that sense to survivability. That we need to think more about how can we sustain the stuff we have and think more about how is our species going to, to survive the next 30 years. And the fundamental basis for this, uh, for these ideas is what we call the four laws of biotics. And the fundamental, most fundamental law, what we call the zeroth law is that humanity may not harm the biosphere or through inaction allow it to be harmed. And then there are modifications to that so that hu humanity may in fact exploit or even destroy part of the biosphere if it's necessary to maintain the, bios the larger biosphere. We may use parts of the biosphere for our own benefit if we do not violate the previous two laws and we can even protect our own existence against things like viruses, for example, so long as we don't protect ourselves in ways that violate the previous laws. So this is the fundamental, a fundamental Darwinian basis for, for the ideas that I'm going to, to quickly summarize now. So the first is how do these ideas inform the way we interact with the rest of the biosphere? And that turns out to be, again, fairly straightforward, but difficult to achieve without a change in behavior. It basically, it means that when we think about things like conservation areas, things like how do human beings uh, encourage uh, interdigitation with the natural world, uh, green, urban green spaces and things like that, Fundamentally, we have to think evolutionarily. We have to think not about conservation areas as gardens where there is a fence and nothing can move in or out. That's the best way to make things go extinct. Evolution requires room to move. You have to think of the areas for conserving biodiversity, the areas where biodiversity will continue to exist, as what we call evolutionary commons. That is connected pieces of different kinds of habitat that allow species to move away from conditions that are unsurvivable into places where they can survive and then later move again as changes continue. So the idea is that what you have to do is provide the circumstances where life can cope with change by changing. That's the fundamental way that, that, that biology has managed, living systems have managed to survive for 4 billion years. Coping with change by changing, not coping with change by resisting that change and hoping that everything will work out for the best somehow. How do we interact with each other under the four laws of biotics? Well, it turns out that there again, what we, what we ought to be doing or what we could be doing is very easy to say, it's not so easy to accomplish. One is that we need to convert from the economics of growth to the economics of well-being. We need to reduce human population density. Now, it's not the same thing as saying that we need to reduce human population in absolute numbers. The reality is that human population, the overall human population is on track to begin decreasing by about 2070. Through natural processes, this is, this is taking care of itself. The immediate problem is population density, not absolute numbers. And we have to think about sustainable regrowth. Population density is the problem. Like I said before, it's not the absolute numbers of people on the planet. So think of how many post-apocalyptic novels and films that you've, that you've read or viewed that show cities 
<coughs> as being the primary refuge from danger and the solution to social or environmental problems, or even the places you go if there's an invasion by aliens from outer space. Nobody shows that. Everybody knows that when there's a problem, cities are the worst place to be. And the pandemic, of course, reinforced that. So how do we reduce population density without just saying, everybody should run away from the cities and everything should fall apart? Well, we do need to reduce population and climate insecure areas, but in a way that allows the people who are, re, uh, who are leaving the climate insecure urban centers to have a place to go where they in fact have the possibility of having a, a real life. And one, one major proposal that's gaining a lot of, of interest now is the notion of revitalizing rural areas. And one of the nice things about moving populations from uh, climate insecure urban centers to rural areas that have experienced population declines is that there's no need to start over. There's no need to begin something new. There's already existing infrastructure. That is, there's already the possibility at one time, people lived in those rural areas. More people live there than live there now. We can restart that, that process. And one of the ways to, to drive that is by making sure that we circularize those new economies and enhance local self-determination in those rural areas. Now, finally, we need to think about human beings accommodate themselves to higher institutions. This is essential for, for sustainable regrowth or survivable regrowth. What we believe is possible is to produce networks of these cooperating small centers, these revitalized rural areas, powered by circular economies. We believe that those networks can maintain the benefits and mitigate the vulnerabilities of high density urbanization. But that's not going to happen unless there is mutual accommodation between institutions that are necessary to coordinate interactions among different communities and the people within those communities. So once again, it's a matter of conflict resolution, not a matter of, of you do this, we do that. Nobody forces anybody, nobody allows, blah, blah, blah. None of this, this aggressive language, this has to be the language of, if, if we don't work together, we're all, we're all going to really lose badly. So about 12,000 years ago, humans began building and abandoning cities in response to climate change. This is one of the reasons that, that we have um, uh, so many archeological sites around the world. There are an enormous number of abandoned settlements and cities that were abandoned as a result of climate change and human beings responding evolutionarily to those climate change events by simply moving away. But for the last 9,000 years or so, we have fundamentally been at war with ourselves. So we've seen this movie, that is, we have seen the outcome of what's the challenges that are hitting us today. We know how this will end because we know how it has ended in every single case for the last 9,000 years. Warfare seems like a good idea at the time, it seems to work for a time, and then it all falls apart. We have the capacity for conflict resolution within us. A major part of that is the fact that we are descended from social primates. We have the ability to be social organisms built into our inheritance. The issue is whether or not we're capable of doing that outside of our own kin groups. That's the major challenge. Now, it, it seems that human beings do have the ability to do this to some extent. That's one of the reasons that even though large, high density urban centers are, are highly vulnerable to climate change, they do function in a way, even though most of the people living in cities don't know each other very well. 
what you have to have in order to, to make the kind of capacity for cooperation that we need for conflict resolution is you need to have a, an interaction among these three variables of so familiarity. You have to know the people you're dealing with. You have to be able to trust them and you have to be able to cooperate with them. And there's no one particular sequence of these things. In a sense, all of these have to operate at the same time, but it is possible to do it. It's not easy, it will not be easy, but it is possible for us to do it. We have the capacity to do this. So now to answer, you know, one of the questions of today is, is it time to panic? Well, our, our, our sense is that it, there's never a good time to panic. And panic doesn't get you anywhere. Panic is a response for immediate survival in an immediate crisis. Panic is, is not something that allows us to plan ahead. We are very late in the game. That is humans are very late responding to the challenges of climate change. We have known about this in a technical sense. We've known about the threat of climate change to uh, technological humanity for more than a century. And we, we have ignored it for more than a century. So we're now very, very late. We're within the last two to three generations before really, really bad things are going to happen. But this is not the time to panic. It's not the time for desperate heroics. And it's not the time for just giving up. It's a time to be pragmatic, creative, proactive, and persistent. It's a time to cope with the present and spend potential on the future. It's a time to be proactive, not just provocative. Or as Mark Twain once said, do the right thing. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. So humanity now is faced with two options right now. With, and we have two or three generations to do this. We can alter our behavior now at enormous cost and persist with much of what we think of as civilization intact. Or we can do nothing, we can continue with business as usual, we can lose everything and then try to rebuild. And it turns out interestingly enough that evolutionary biology gives us hope even if we do nothing and we lose everything and we have to rebuild because the principles that I've laid out could be applied to rebuilding society after a major implosion, as well as being able to uh, help us survive as we are now if we're willing to change our behavior. Oh, what happened here? Ah, well, that's. Sorry about that. So much for the big finale. So evolution gives us hope even if we fail in this century. Things fall apart. There's still the possibility of rebuilding. Uh, if we're smart enough to rebuild along the lines of, of things like you know, basic <clears throat> notions of conflict resolution and cooperation, um, rebuilding without thinking that we have to go back to the old ways of, of growth is good and it's all survival of the fittest and everybody needs to, you know, everybody needs to fight and the winners are the only ones left alive at the end. If we can get over that sort of behavior that has been customary for us in the last 9,000 years, but was not part of human behavior for the 3 million years before that, then even if we don't succeed in prolonging technological hum humanity in this century, we're in a position that we could in fact rebuild afterwards. So there's, there's, there's a reason to act, there's no reason to panic. Thank you.